Okay, so welcome, uh, Keep High Pie Fellows and artists from imanartist.net uh, platform. Uh, tonight, our happy hour guest is Mike O'Connor, who is our storytelling guru. And uh, I think he's going to have something really interesting for us tonight. And um, welcome, Mike O'Connor. Thanks, Andy. Um, and thank you for the time tonight. And <clears throat> for everybody who dialed in tonight, thanks you. I really, really appreciate it. And um, um, to Palmer and to um, Juliet, thank you guys for coming in too. They're not members, but they're they're part of what I'm doing tonight as far as um, basically talking about artist stories or art stories. And um, let me just start off by saying, um, I listened to the, uh, watched and listened to the um, interview that Melissa Chu had with Ai Weiwei last week from, from Hawaii. And one thing she said about halfway through the interview, she was talking to Ai Weiwei about, about you know, what he thinks artists should do. And they were in a conversation how artists ap approach galleries and approach people. And Melissa was talking to, to uh, she was, you know, actually doing the talking here. And she said, you know, so many artists come to me and say, I'm a photographer, I'm a sculptor, I'm a, I'm a painter. She said, but that's, that's not the way they think of themselves. I, I'm paraphrasing. And she said, the way they think of themselves is the idea comes first. So I played that a few times and I thought about it. And, and I think what they're saying is, when she's talking about the idea comes first, she's talking about the story. And the story is, I mean, you guys thinking, oh God, there's Mike's broken record about the story, but guess what? No elevator pitch tonight. This is about the art story, the art statement, not the artist statement. This is about the art statement. And it, it came about because just the way everything has is, is there are so many, great presentations of work, whether it be in a museum, a gallery, a video, or whatever. So many great presentations of work visually. And the, the statement that the artist is making so many times is just, it just falls flat on his face. And it does not, it does the artist no good and it does not do anything positive for the art itself. So they're both kind of left out there to flounder because uh, so many times the artist just does not know how to talk about their work. Um, I recently had a class where I was showing some demos of bad statements versus good statements with the artist presentation. And I did what everybody does is you go on YouTube. Um, I had absolutely no problem finding art presentations with statements that weren't very good and stories that weren't good it is really really hard to find one that you that, that there's a statement that fits the art and takes you through a story or a journey of the artwork as the artist is going through it so the listener the viewer the person in the room or uh, or on the zoom or whatever gets an idea of what the artist is really doing and then gets the full gist of what the art is okay now tonight um I've got a number of um, short videos that I'm going to show you, um, an audio. But before we do this, I'm going to, I have a story for you. And I was going to tell this story tonight. And Catherine said, Mike, why don't you play the edition that they did at the Moth? So I said, okay. In other words, that's better than me telling it. But it and so... Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the moth, that's that's where the um, in the major cities in the country, the local PBS station, whether it be a radio station or a or TV station, will rent a venue for the night, whether it's a um, a club or something in that a comedy club, a nightclub, whatever. They'll rent it for the night, open it up, and then they'll announce it. And if you want to go and get on stage and tell a story, you can do it. But they give you they give you a title. Um, or a theme, they give you six minutes, it has to be truthful, and it has to be about yourself. You can't make up stuff, and you can't be a, a professional comedian coming in practicing. So I've done this a number of times, the, the moth in Los Angeles, and um, 
what happens is about 250 to 300 people go in there and they all pay to get in, but only about 20 people volunteer to talk. And out of those 20, they literally put their name in the hat and 10 of them are picked. So this is how it's done. And they don't see who it is. So, so the people aren't up there picking, oh, here's uh, uh, Sally, what's her name? Let's pick her because she's really good. They just grab someone and, and pray and hope for the best. So unfortunately their prayers were not answered, but I was picked, chosen a number of times. And this one time the theme was romance. And I had a story that I had told before and I, um, um, anyway, I'm going to show it to you. Um, Andy, can I share the screen? Am I allowed to now? Did you do that for me? I'm good. All right. I'm going to show you this video and then I've, I'm going to talk to you about it afterwards because I have a feeling I know what your very first question is going to be after it. So uh, please bear with me on this and uh, we'll get this going here. Hang on. Everybody see this okay? Yes. A big black screen? Yes. And it, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and while I was in you, I got my pilot's license. Now, at the same time I got my pilot's license, I was going to be a pilot. So I hope that something would be a pilot. I mean, it was a guy. And I was going to be a pilot. Mike, we can't hear the sound. I'll get it. I'll fix it for you right now. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear it? A number of years ago, I was living in San Diego. <clears throat> and it, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and while living in San Diego, I got my pilot's license. Now, at the same time I got my pilot's license, I was courting this young woman who I hoped that someday would be my wife. Her name was Kathy. And I was always trying to impress her, as hopefully anybody does that's, that's courting someone, dating somebody. So, so I decided, you know, I know, how to, I know how to really, really impress her. Now, Kathy had a friend, a lifelong friend, that lived in Santa Barbara. And I decided, well, we'll just take a flight up to Santa Barbara to visit her friend, but I'm gonna surprise Kathy. So I, on a Thursday, I said, Kathy, we're gonna go up and visit your friend Linda in Santa Barbara. So get everything ready and I'll pick you up Friday morning at eight o'clock. So at eight o'clock, we took off from San Diego, driving up the road. We got as far as Carlsbad to this little street called Palomar Airport Road, turned off, went to Palomar Airport and pulled up in front of my little airplane. She had no idea we were gonna fly up to Santa Barbara. She thought we were going to drive. She was really giddy in the car, a lot of talking because she hadn't seen her friend for a while. And as soon as she saw the airplane, she got silent. And I was anticipating that she was silent because she thought, oh my God, this is the best gift I could ever have. This is, this is gonna be so swell, Mike's taking me flying. So into the plane we got. Now, for those of you who have ever flown or know anything about flying, what we were flying was a Cessna 150. For those of you who know nothing about flying, a Cessna 150 is, is, is equivalent to a 72 Volkswagen with wings on it. <laughs> now, it, it has about the same speed, it has about the same performance, and the same lack of comfort. comfort. <laughs> so we took off from Palomar Airport in North San Diego County. We're gonna fly up the coast to Santa Barbara. It was a very, very windy day. Now, for me, it was no big deal. So off we went, we're flying up there, and planes bouncing around and going back and forth like this and just doing all kinds of stuff that you would normally not want a plane to do. Now, I was used to it. I have been flying for months and months getting my license. <laughs> Kathy, on the, on, the, on the other hand, her last flight was first class in a 747. <laughs> but uh, what do I know? So off we go into Santa Barbara. We're flying up there. We get to Santa Barbara. I line it up on the runway, get on the horn, talk to the guys in the tower, let them know what my intentions are. And they said, Mike, you're clear to land. They didn't say Mike, but it, I implied that they did. So we landed, and it was one of my typical landings, um, five or six bounces before the plane actually came to a stop. <laughs> but again, remember, this is a 72 Volkswagen, so it wasn't that big a deal. Now, one other thing, on the way up there, 
Back in the days when I learned how to fly, when you fly around Los Angeles Airport, you all know about Los Angeles International Airport, it's a big airport. What the rules said were you fly directly over it, right over the center of the airport, at about 2,000 feet elevation, and you don't talk to the tower. You just be quiet. So as we flew over LA Airport, I was just doing my normal thing, just saying, hey, Kathy, look at there's a DC-3 down there, there's a 747. And she's looking out her window, she sees planes coming in like this. Looking out my window, she sees planes going out like that. She was still quiet, holding on to the little bar up front, thinking, oh, God, she's loving this. It's like being in a roller coaster. She's just having a ball. <laughs> now, we were in Santa Barbara for a couple of days, and just before we left to come home, um, I remember saying, okay, Kathy, we're going to go. Linda's going to bring us down to the airport. And she said something about a train station. I didn't pay any attention to it. <laughs> so off to the airport we went and got in the plane. And this was even a windier day. Uh, Santa Ana was blowing. For those of you who don't know what Santa Ana's are, they're hellacious winds that come from the east, and they're very, very strong. They're stronger than this plane can fly. And I proved it to Kathy on the way back down. So <laughs> as we were flying, we couldn't gain much altitude because the wind was hitting these mountains going up in the air and pushing us down. I recognized all the guys in the lineup down in the surf for the years I surfed down there, but Kathy, I guess she was impressed. She didn't know any of the surfers down there. She didn't say anything. So I gained a little bit of altitude, and over LAX we went again, Los Angeles Airport. So we flew over that again, and I'm pointing out airplanes. And then we line up the runway with Palomar Airport in Carlsbad. Now, the thing about this landing, if you recall, it's very, very windy. Airplanes like wind. It keeps them aloft, especially these smaller airplanes. But one of the things about it is, if it's really windy, the plane doesn't want to land very well. So what I did is I did a couple little maneuvers to get this plane down. First thing I did is I turned the nose into the wind, because I was going this way. Normally, the wind comes this way, but now it was coming from over here. So I lined the nose of the airplane up into the wind so it would stay flying. So if you can imagine, Kathy's sitting over here, and instead of looking out the windshield to see the runway, she's looking out her right window, looking down at the runway like this. I think she enjoyed it. <laughs> and then I dipped the right wing down a little bit because we had to get out of the air and land the airplane. So, so with the plane coming in at an angle like this, I'm just having a great old time. And I said, now watch this, Kathy. And I dipped the wing down, and into the last minute, got it all squared away touched the ground six or eight times this time, but it was bounce, it was windy. What are you gonna do? So we lined up in front of the tower. I got out of the plane, I looked at Kathy and I said, Kathy, what'd you think? Did you have a good time? And she looked at me with those big blue Irish eyes and said, Mike, I want you to make me a promise. And I said, sure, what's that? She said, I want you to promise me, Mike, that you will never fly this airplane without me. And I said, oh, I did it. I impressed her. I can see the wedding bells coming now. And I said, you got my promise. And then she looked at me and said, and I am never flying with you again. <laughs> now, I will say. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. So I have a feeling that the very first question on your mind is, Okay, Mike, you had fun telling that story. What in the heck does it have to do with art and us here tonight? And my answer is everything. Think back on that very last thing that I said about what Catherine said to me when um, I made her the promise. And she said, I'm never flying with you again. Think about this. What do you think that flight would have been? Well, the flight wouldn't have been any different, but what do you think Catherine's attitude would have been had I, before the flight, briefed her on what to expect, told her that it's going to be bouncy, but don't worry about it. This plane can take a lot more than these winds can deliver. Um, by the way, when we go to Los Angeles International Airport, we're actually going to fly over the center of it. It's the safest place on the airport. Planes will be coming in underneath us and taking off, et cetera, et cetera. And, and um, all the, the things that were happening uh, as the plane was flying up and as the plane was flying back and we're not going to gain much altitude, but it doesn't matter. We're going to have fun. The scenery is much better down here at 2,000, 3,000 feet. And, um, and also the landing. 
that that slip maneuver is done by you know commercial pilots all the time not as much because they, they can take 30 mile an hour wind more than this airplane can that's almost top speed for that airplane going downhill so so if but had i warned her not warned her but just informed her of what's going on and then as we're going along to remind her Catherine, we're coming up on uh, LA airport right now. Remember what we're going to do. And remember, they don't want us to talk to the tower because they're busy with these other people. There's a person up there with their binoculars on. They can see me. They know exactly what's going on. It's the safest way to go. Plus the fact if something does happen, they can say aircraft 223 flying above LAX, uh, do a U-turn and, and climb up another thousand feet. They'll tell you that right away. And it's something that I practice during flight training. It's all part of the procedure on everything I do when I'm flying up and back. That landing maneuver, I, I, I did that a million times. I had fun doing it. It's a lot of fun. It's scary as hell, excuse me, but it is fun. And <clears throat> if you don't know what's going on, you don't know what to expect. And she got a very bad attitude about this flight and about flying in this little Volkswagen, excuse me, airplane. And <clears throat> everything about this whole flight that I was just so excited about and so had so much fun doing and just showing off the skills that I had learned and, and over the last six months and learning how to fly and getting my pilot's license and 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 it all turned out to where she wasn't impressed at all <laughs> she she didn't get it she didn't understand I didn't take her on the journey ahead of time and I didn't let her know during this flight what was going on I think you guys get what I'm talking about here if if you have a presentation if you're going to show a body of work, if you're going to represent yourself, whether it be in a museum, in a gallery, you're going to do a, a video of, a, of, of your art in an artist tour, a studio tour, or you're going to show your work and, and do a video of your latest body of work and distribute that, send it out to people. Um, you really, really must have a good story to go with it. So many people don't understand that because they spend all their time and energy and money and focus on getting the right equipment to be able to get these and who's the good photographer, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, you got to have a story. Oh, yeah, I'll take care of that. The script. Yeah, I know what I'm going to talk about. I did this work. I know what I'm going to say. I think everyone really, really should consider taking it one step farther. And that one step farther is scripting this, this presentation out before you even consider what you're going to shoot in a video, or what you're going to present, what you're going to do any, any time you're going to present this work. This is basically what, what, what Melissa Chu was saying when she was talking to Ai Weiwei. I've heard Andy talk about it a million times. I talked with um, so many gallery owners that, that, that and, and that's what I talk to them about. I, I don't show them my art. I ask them questions about what it takes to, 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 to get you to, uh, to appreciate and feel about someone's work the way they do. And quite frankly, most of it's two or three words. Mike, it's the story. What am I looking at? So, so this, is, this is what I consider a really, really critical part, of, critical part of your mission is creating a script and creating a story of your art. You all have the story, every one of you does. It's, it's just like your elevator pitch. You know what's going on. You know why you created a body of work. It's not, it's not a surprise to you. You can't look at it and say, well, you can, but it's not a valid thing for you to look at the work and say, I don't know why I did it. I just did it. That's true. You just did it, but you, you do know why deep inside, you know why you did this body of work. Why was it this piece, then this piece, then this piece, and then this piece, but those other four pieces you did two years ago, they're not included. Or the one you're going to do next month, you're not going to include it because these are a central theme. Let us know as viewers what you want us to see, what you want us to hear. And it's as simple as taking somebody on the journey of your work. Take us on a journey. Let us be a part of that story. Because remember, when you watch a story or hear a story or watch a movie that's, that's a part of an epic story, most people will insert themselves in that story. They'll either become one of the one of the the stars of it, or one of the one of the people in the story, or they'll tag along with this person because ah, that's the kind of person I want to tag along with. We could be buddies. You don't really change the story; you become part of it. 
So if you tell me, as I'm looking at a body of artwork, what I'm looking at as you're going through it, man, I get this, I get this feeling now about the entire body of work. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen with so many artists here at Key Pai Pai where, where, they, where they actually get to a point of showing their work later and putting a story in it. And it's a completely different body of work. It's completely different images. It, not the images are the same, but you, you know what I'm saying? They're, the, the perception of the images is completely different. So, so it's really critical to do this. So one of the things I did is, is, um, is I, I created this class to um, get people to start doing stories. And it, it, thanks to Jane, it morphed into a video class. So, but regardless of that. And so I've been working with people um, in the class and outside of class about um, the very first thing, the most important thing is getting a script, getting a good idea and telling us what you're going to do about your work. And, and I've taken, I've worked with a number of artists who have shown me a number of images, very well done, whether it's paintings, drawings, photographs, whatever. And they say, yeah, it's all one body of work. And I get them to tell me what the story is and, and then make a script, create a script, and then guess what? I say, by the way, how does this hang on the wall? And they say like this. And I said, it doesn't fit your script. Why don't you change that? Why don't you rehang those pieces or reassemble those pieces to where they fit your script? And everything comes in, everything comes into, into um, a natural focus that way. And it's the way they're supposed to be. And when the artist talks about it, they're much more relaxed because they're not jumping from A to S to L back to Q and then back to B and then D, they're going from A, B, C, D, all the way down the line of, of, of their work. So what I'm going to do, if, you'll, if you guys will indulge me real quick, we have a guest, Juliet Haas here tonight, and I'm going to play for you an audio of hers that she made. This was, she was not in the video class, but she's, she's getting ready to make a video because she's, you can ask her, but I, I think she's really enthused about this audio that you did. This is an audio track, and it's after we work together. None of this is my creation. It's all hers, and, and we worked through this. I coached her on how to put the pieces together and then, and then create your, um, your script and present it. And this is the first recording she did of it, so, so hang tight with me for a second while I dig it up here. Good evening, my name is Juliette Haas. I'm going to share with you my project, Return to the Desert, that I shot in 2014, over the month of August. I actually started this project long before because I grew up in Reno, Nevada, in the high desert outside. Um, in the sagebrush in the middle of BLM property and I've been photographing abandoned structures and I don't know, just I've been in love with the open spaces and the, the unknown territory of the desert. So um, this first image, you're looking in through an empty television. It's kind of my media piece like the, the vapidness of the media and what we're taught is what we need to live. I call it TV land. <laughs> and it was shot in Bombay Beach, Salton Sea, which is basically my favorite place to photograph things. It's just absolutely decrepit and falling down and covered with graffiti. And it's amazing and, and terrifying at the same time. Um, so I started my trip down there uh, at the Salton Sea, and I went up north through Morongo and Joshua Tree. tree. <clears throat> and the second place I stopped along my journey was this 
blue house under surveillance. I, I titled it Surveilled just because it's written there, it's obvious, but I drove past this house at least a few miles and I just had this gnawing feeling in my gut I needed to go back and photograph it. It's obviously a burnt out cookhouse or something. I call them the dead crack houses. <laughs> That's my term for them. Um, and basically I just drive down the road and if I see something that really gives me a hit, you know, a hit in the gut, I know that's something I need to stop, pull over, and photograph. On after Morongo, I keep driving, keep driving, keep driving. I come through Amboy, and I've never gone this way before. Headed way around the side of Joshua Tree, out into no man's land on the way to Roy's Cafe, the famous Roy's Cafe on Highway 66. So I stopped at the chloride, chloride manufacturing plant, which is across the street from this underwear hanging on a Okay, the only reason I stopped that is because it, it's it's about 10 or 11 minutes long. Um, really quickly, Juliet, let me ask you, um, first of all, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, Juliet, um, this is the first recording you made and you're going to do a video of the um, presentation, which is, which is a stellar presentation. Um, do you think by scripting this first, it helped you in putting the, the, it will help you in putting the video together or help you put the presentation together when you show it? I think it will definitely help. I mean, I've never really done any kind of speaking in this way about a project. So it was kind of a frightening thing and I haven't reapproached making a video yet. Yep. But um, it did help me definitely figure out which order I want to put them in and and um, hit a lot of the bullet points we talked about in our lessons together about the project and how to speak about things. I, I think it really gave a different kind of life to to the pieces that I hadn't even considered before. So good, good. Can I, um, can I hop in here real quick just for a yeah. second? I just want yes. to say, and I'm sure everyone else is feeling the same way. We didn't even need images. <laughs> no, we're, good. we're doing such a great job telling the story that we were able, well, at least I was, to imagine the broken TV that you were viewing through at the Salton Sea um, and driving on the road and what Joshua Tree looks like and, you know, all of those things. So the storytelling was great. And imagine it would be 10 times better if there were images there, but it was still really a good story from what we could have heard. I don't know. That's my opinion. <laughs> Excellent, because that was actually a, a, one of the things I was going to address. And Juliet, I did not tell Andy about this at all. I did not prompt her to say <laughs> that. And and I played this for some people. And one person, I said, what do you see in your mind's eye? Because obviously there's no images. And the person said, this Bombay beach, it sounds like this beautiful, warm, tropical beach. And I said, yeah, it's warm. <laughs> it's not in the least bit tropical, nor is it um, uh, a, a beautiful beach. But but the point is, is just like you, Andy, she went off and she just started imagining what this really looked like. And that that is the magic and that is the brilliance of telling a good story um, and taking us on a journey of your work. Because when you guys see the work, along with this, it's like, it, it's like, God, had I seen that without the story, it makes so much difference. And regardless of what your work is, um, regardless of the quality, top quality, when you let us know what your thought process was, and, and when you put this together, it makes all the difference in the world and how we feel about it. And remember your audience, I'm not talking about so much other artists, because other artists will look at it differently than, than, than people who are not of the art world, people are not artists, we will look at it much differently. And if you let us know what we're looking at, boy, does it make a big difference. So does anybody have any questions or concerns or, or uh, comments about, about um, 
I'm going to um, jump in again. The, yeah. the prompts that the visual prompts that she gave us in the story are so important. Um, yep. They were the things like I saw, you know, the, 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 I, I forgot if you said it was underwear or socks or something laundry that was hanging along the road as you were on your way to this famous desert cafe. Yeah. And there were all these things that you personally found connections to in the journey, right? That inspired you to take the work. You're not describing the artwork. You're telling us about the story of what was inspirational to you and and on this journey, how, what were the what were the visual prompts that uh, created interest for you that made you want to take the photographs? You're not describing the photographs. And that's I want everyone, all the artists to think about that. We're not the the storytelling is not for you to describe the work. It's to tell the story of how the work came about or what created those prompts, visual prompts for you to make that work or the inspiration or the story that gets us through the work, right? Uh, well said, and I agree. And just now, think about this too: when when you're when you're thinking about the the story and the images, guess what the questions are going to be after the presentation? They're not going to be, you know, what focal length did you use, and what kind of camera, and and uh, you know, where was the sun in the sky that day? They're going to be questions about the work itself and about your thought pattern and and your thought process and what the work is. Uh, and, you know, questions that that are important. And the technical questions, you can always do that afterwards. The shop talk type questions, you can always do that afterwards. Let, hey, let's get together after and I'll go through how I did that technically. But, but the questions are going to be good, meaningful feeling questions, OK? Um, now this, uh, I, have, I have two videos that I'm going to show, short videos. Um, just remember, these are works in progress. And they're all working on these things and making edits because it, it's basically for them, it's the first time. Um, in this class that we were doing, we were really fortunate. Christopher Rico was, was a part of the class and, and he gave a lot of good technical assistance and knowledge. And um, one reason I had is because I showed his video. I'm not gonna show it right this minute um, if we have time afterwards. I think most of you have seen it, but, um, but the thing is, is Christopher shot this video of himself in his studio by himself on an iPhone and did, um, not all the editing on the iPhone, but you could, but it's easier to do it on a, on a, you know, a laptop or something like that. But the point is, is he did it and he did it by himself. He shot it by himself. And this is what, um, what, when I talk to people about the videos, I'm not saying don't hire someone to do a video for you on the contrary, but if you want to do a quick promo video, um, you're certainly capable of doing it in your studio or, or, if it's in a gallery and take us on a walkthrough and and describe it just just as just as um, uh, Juliet just did now and just as the other two um, videos are going to describe when I show it to you in a second. Now the videos are their very first try doing it themselves. So we're, we're in the process of, of editing these and, and they will come up with some um, products afterwards because when I asked these artists if we could show it tonight they said well Mike I am not done with it it's not finished I'm not through editing I said that's okay we're just and I'm not going to show the whole thing I'm going to show you know a little bit of uh, a minute or two of each one and and then we can discuss it but um, uh, we have another um, guest tonight Palmer Earl who's who's a painter here in Los Angeles and also in in New York and she's got just really really good work Thank you. Getting prompts from my coach. Um, she's got some she, some remarkable work, and she actually really does have a brilliant story about putting these pieces together and what she did. So we we this is her first take on it, and um, she had real issues about doing a video. And I'll talk to her about it at the end because it's pretty interesting um, what she did because she had a, a really good concern that could have scuttled this thing. So. Hang on here just a second again.
Oh, hang on, wrong one. Okay. I'm really interested in how ancient cultures shape the way that women are treated today. I research ancient history and mythology and religion, and I find examples of stories or events that I think have the most impact on women today, and I use them as subject matter for my paintings. The earliest people worshipped a great goddess that was in the form of a bird, and she was the layer of the cosmic egg. In this painting, the bird goddess is seeking revenge on modern people who have replaced her with militant male gods and have little respect for her earth now. For the switch from female god to male god in the major religion of the world, mythologies had to be created showing that the goddess was killed by this all-powerful male god. This is what's left of the goddess Tiamat's body after the young male god Marduk kills her and supposedly created the entire world from the pieces of her body. In the Iliad, as well as other ancient texts, the goddesses, while once there was an all-powerful, multifaceted goddess, now in ancient Greek texts, there's little pieces of, of the main goddess that have turned into these one-dimensional lesser goddesses that are not equal in power to, to Zeus, who is now the king of the gods. Okay. Oh, hang on. Palmer, when you, um, Palmer, are you still with us? Are you still here? Oh, you got to unmute yeah. yourself, Palmer. Okay, good, thanks. Um, Palmer had a really good question in the beginning when we were talking about doing these videos. And she said, um, she said, Mike, my studio is a one car garage and I've got lots of stuff in there. It'd be so hard and distracting to take somebody on a studio tour. And, um, I, I can't just walk around because I'd be kind of standing in the center and going in a circle like this. And, and between paintings, there would be too many things and I can't hang the paintings here and there. So, so um, uh, a number of the people that were in the class and Christopher, every, everybody said, then it's simple, take still images, take a still picture of it. And then just when you do the editing, keep it on for a long time and have it fade in and fade out and do, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with that. And thus she did. She just she she's got a brilliant story. It wasn't finished. And as we discussed before this, that that um, the video and the story are not finished, but it's all part of a um, it's all part of a um, um, what what I say is a good journey. The story, the studying, and the and the and the foretelling of the mythology, and then showing us the paintings that match each of the pieces in the story. So um, does anybody have any question or comment um, for Palmer? I'm going to jump in again. Good. <laughs> um, if I don't, I'm not familiar with her work, and it makes me super interested. Good. <laughs> Mission accomplished. So does, does this- Wait, wait, I'm going to jump in too. Oh, good. Hey Palmer, it's Betty Brown. Oh, hi, how are you? 
I'm really fine, thank you. Um, as you know, I know your work. I've mentioned it in uh, essays. Um, but I want, and, and I love seeing more of it than I had seen before, so thank you. Thank you. I would like to hear from all of you, and this uh, applies to Juliet as well, two or three sentences about who you are and how you got here. Both you and Juliet are just jumping into the work. Um, Juliet said, well, I shot blah, 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 and nothing about I'm a photographer and I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I would like to hear that from you as well, Palmer. I think that especially when you're addressing the general public, they, they want to know not just what you're doing, but how you got there and why you do it. Okay. And I didn't hear any of that from you. I know this is a very rough draft. As you know, I'm a writer and we have, um, we, in our profession, we have what is um, you know, uh, uh, professionally termed a shitty first draft. Yes, it's not finished. <laughs> we all do a shitty first draft and then the work begins, right? Yeah. Um, and then the work begins of shaping it into something that is, you know, what you're, you want to represent yourself with. But anyway, again, I'm a big fan of your work. That's why I've written about it. And that's why I um, was glad to see more of it. But I would love to hear, and it doesn't have to be a big autobiographical discourse, but I, just yeah. two or three sentences about how you got here and why this is you know why these have been the choices that you've made okay. and um i think especially the general public is mystified like why would that beautiful woman do artwork like that <laughs> you know they they don't know and and i think that in addition to telling them about the work you need to tell them a little bit to help them understand how you got into that work does that make sense, Palmer? Yeah. I would like to hear that. I mean, I would like to hear that. Um, even if I do kind of know your work, sort of, because I've, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I would like to hear those two or three sentences. And frankly, I'd like to hear them from everybody. Okay. You know, I um, think that is an important part of your story, especially for non-artists because they're mystified. They, you know, they didn't go through life translating their experiences into visual images. Right. So the fact that that's what you do is already kind of miraculous and magical and mystifying and maybe intimidating. And if you can just give them a few little straightforward steps into it, um, it you will expand their, your audience hugely because they'll be more comfortable and they'll have more easy entry into it. Okay, that's it. Sorry Thank to interrupt. You. Thank you. We're good to see your work again, sweetie. So keep okay. at it, okay? Yeah, I am. I want to add on to that, on to what Betty just said. I think that um, too often, especially in my position, the artist says things like, I love to draw as a child. That is not the moment that you want to share about your work. The moment that you want to share about your work is the moment that you realized drawing as a child was something more than just drawing. And that usually happens when you're a teenager or you're in your early 20s, when you have major life events that you can relate that the ability to create something also is meaningful in a way of you turning into a human being, like a grown up human being. So that, that life event that all of a sudden, this isn't just drawing because it makes me feel good or moving paint around or whatever it is that you're doing that you did as a child. Um, it's that moment that we want to know about because everybody loves to draw when they're a child. But why is your drawing as a child and what happened in that like, and I'm just using that as an example. I don't know if you right. were drawing as a child, but you know, a lot of artists say that like, <laughs> oh, I, lo I loved taking pictures and I got my first brownie when I was seven. It's like, everybody had a brownie. We were all taking pictures when we were seven. But what was that thing that happened to you in your life that made it go from the cathartic moment growing up and dealing with how you are to the 
I'm making something that everyone else that I think I should be sharing with other people that there's something here and that's the moment we want to hear about um because that's the pivotal moment in your life that's the most interesting yes indeed well done ladies thank you both that's that's good information very good information and remember I've got one more to show you and and to to talk about real quick um these are first drafts um, done by themselves. No professional, no one else came in. So, so yeah, they realize they have a lot of work, but you know what? Not that much. I think, I think they've got, um, they've so far. And when you see Jane's here in a minute too, you'll see they've got a handle on it. They've got a good start on it. And before you know it, they'll be doing their own promo videos and tour videos that, that look professionally developed. And, that's what I'm trying to get people to understand. And, and later on, if you don't do it, if you have someone else do it professionally, that's fine. But if you can do it, then at the right moment, you need to post something. You can shoot a quick video of yourself and post it. So, so um, Palmer, thanks. Do you, did, Palmer, did you have anything that you wanted to say? Any comment about this whole process? How I put you on the spot? Really, um, I mean, it's good for me because I, I'm not a, I get nervous of talking to people, um, yeah. and you know, I mean, um, anyway, I've I've enjoyed I've enjoyed. It's good for me to do this sort of thing, this video sort of thing. So um, I'm glad to get feedback, and um, I don't. I think it's I think it's been good for me, and I thank you for all your help. Oh gosh, well, I'll I'll be in touch with you afterwards I anyway because we'll <laughs> work this out. So. All right, thanks, Palmer. Um, I've got one last one that we'll discuss here. So hang on one second while I make electric things work here again. Good evening. Okay, this is this is Jane. I think you all know Jane. So this isn't her entire video. It's a portion of it just because of time. And by the way, um, there were a number of videos. I picked these two tonight just because of time. And also, um, this is the first ones that these two people have ever done. So um, but the, the big element was time. We're running out of time now, so, but don't worry. Some people write in journals to express their feelings and emotions. I make pictures to tell stories. As a conceptual artist, I'm always looking for a unique visual language to share stories from my life. But the stories that I tell are universal. The series Family Matters began when I sold my parents' home and helped them move into an assisted living facility. I brought home many of the treasured objects and searched for a way to tell a story about our family. I knew that I didn't want to make just a catalog of objects, but rather a catalog of feelings, emotions, and family dynamics. The objects are frequently paired with other items to create tension and expand the narrative. Though the viewer may not know the exact story behind each image, they will feel the visceral emotion that is embedded into each picture. Repetition of materials also helps enforce the story and feelings. Thread, for example, is a recurring element, indicating a sense of unraveling and the attempt to bind things back together. When an elderly parent with dementia is moved to a new home, they can become confused and ungrounded. My frequent travels back and forth out of state left me feeling equally ungrounded. I was restless and seeking. I wanted to be somewhere else. Okay. Thanks, Jane. Jane. Um, first of all, th this actually has another whole part to it. 
But again, and, and we're running so close out of time here. I just, I just shut it off early. But um, also, she's you know, still in the process of working on this. It's basically the first one she's ever done. Um, but Jane, did this, did this have any impact on the way you talk about your work when you actually went through the, the, the task of putting this all together? Um, I'll just preface this by saying it's actually the second video I made. Ah. Um, and the first one was so bad that the oh, second I, remember, I did yeah. it, I said, oh my God, I need Mike's help. Well, um, I remember I didn't so, count that. <laughs> it was that bad. Um, yeah, it was. And it's super hard and challenging for me doing this work and talking in front of, you know, doing the audio recording is just, I don't know what my hang up is, but it's a big one. Um, well, it's, it, it's interesting. Um, and I, you and I talked about this before and we'll fix it. Um, but the audio recording is not as good as the presentation you gave of this body of work at MOA. And I'm much more reading. comfortable in person than I am when you put a recorder on. Somehow I just, I'm I paralyzed. You, microphones will bite you. You got to be careful of them. So, so not like people, they'll just let you go. But your, your delivery at MOA was just, you were taking us on a story. We were sitting in your living room with you. You were talking to everybody as if you'd known them forever and vice versa. And that's what we need to do when you, when you record. Once you record it once or twice, um, you'll get it. And, and I've edited it since what you have. I've, I've been trying to clean it up right. a little bit and just make it flow a little yep. better. So I know that yep. initial recording is very stiff and choppy and I'm working on it. I know you are. I know. Listen, um, um, Jay, can I just um, say one thing? Sure, Betty. Since you're still continuing working on this, I would take out the sentence, I'm a conceptual artist. If you want this to appeal to the general public, they don't know what that means. And I would just say I'm a photographer. But if you want to talk about being a conceptual artist, I, I think you should at least explain it. Good point, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the general public doesn't know what those words mean. I promise you, I know this. And a couple of sentences if you want to use it or leave it out because it's actually not necessary. I, I actually th think the footage in your video is exquisite and your story is very clear and my heart went out to it. So don't change much, girl. It's well on its way. No, Thank the story you so is much. great. The story yeah. is great. Yeah. She's, she just has to get to the point where she just, like she has done in the past, talks about it like we're sitting around with her and not reading it. So, and it's just being comfortable. And she'll, she, it's, this is so much better than the first iterations of it. And I, I imagine one or two more recordings and it's good. You, you won't even tell that she was, you know, that she had an issue, that she was just a natural. So, um, and that's the way it is with all the people that we've worked with tonight. And, and Juliet, I, I know that as soon as Jane heard Juliet, she says, I'm hiring her to talk about my work on my video. <laughs> so uh, that voice. Oh, my God. That I voice. know. It. I know. It. It's 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 a killer. So listen, you guys, um, we're about out of time. Uh, thank you all for for um, hanging on with me through this little journey through a couple of people that we work with and and um, the, the stories that they're doing, the videos that they're doing and how they're trying to get to the point where the, the video and the story will actually tell the story by taking people on a journey of their artwork. The, the feeling that we will get is the feeling that you had when you, make it, when you made it and that's the goal. So with that, thanks everybody. And um, Andy, I'll throw it back to you. Andy, you got on mute. I was muted. Sorry, I'm sitting here talking away. Thank you, Mike. That was an awesome presentation. And oh, thanks. I'm glad that you had some kind of works in progress uh, so that our other artists can, you know, not feel so bad that other people struggle with this too. And um, just know if definitely if you're a key pie pie artist that you have each other as resources to bounce ideas uh, off of each other to contact your faculty members. We're here, we're happy to give you feedback, um, give you suggestions. I know Betty and I are both open to, 
I know, I don't know if Ray is here, but he's also um, available. Um, and on that note of, you know, being, um, having your other uh, Keep High Pie members as resources, um, a subject before we started this, this meeting tonight uh, came around and there was an opportunity that's popping up and I'm gonna let Voice Love talk about that in a second. But what I do wanna bring up is, um, I really need to stress how important it is that you all have websites that are up to date. If you haven't noticed, your website is listed on the Keep High Pie webpage um, in the fellow section in the artists and people are looking at those. And we've had some comments about why aren't your artists updating their websites? And why is, why is their work not up, updated? And they're looking at the website and it's showing shows from three years ago, but nothing since. Those are missed opportunities, both for sales and for curatorial projects. Um, also, your social media. This is super, super important because this has come up time and time again. And, and this came up again tonight. Curators looking to curate you because you're a Keep Pie Pie artist and then going and trying to find you on social media and there's no images of your work. There is nothing of you working on your work. There's no process, there's nothing. So um, this is not the way to, to have, to get involved in being an artist, being picked by a curator. Um, I, I've said it over and over and over to everyone. It's so important. Your Instagram is updated with images of your work. If you're using Facebook as an artist, then put artist put artwork on there. Don't have cat pictures. Don't have political, you know, postings. Use that in a way to promote yourself as an artist. Um, I was really sad when I. I mean, I've heard this a couple of times where people have said, "Oh, I want to curate your Key Pie Pie artist," but then when I go on their websites, there's nothing. There are artists that have the work is not up to date and I don't even know what they're working on. So I just wanted to bring it up uh, tonight and on that, with that message, but also that one of our Key Pie Pie fellows is curating a show, a second show, and is looking to um, include other Key Pie Pie artists. So uh, Voice Love, you wanna just pop on here and kind of talk to everybody about the opportunity? Thank you, Andy. Um, thank you, Mike, for this uh, really uplifting conversation about uh, our talks. And it was quite fun to listen to everything. Um, talking about what Andy just mentioned, um, I'm curating together with Jason Jen uh, exhibition that is going to be open on April uh, in Angel's Gate. And the theme that we were working on uh, is a sanctuary of the aftermath. Uh, we had in mind few of Key Pai Pai artists, but basically one of the policies of the galleries is that they don't want to present artists who are already presented in that space in last three years. And uh, since this project is really interesting and something that really um, excites us, uh, we wanted to actually continue to cu curate another show or to make a proposal for another uh, show for a Sola Contemporary. Uh, open call is um, open until March 15th. So we don't have enough time. We do have already like five artists from Keep Pai Pai group. And uh, next Friday, I'm going to do a presentation of this um, concept and the uh, presentation of few artworks by those five artists from Keep Pai Pai. And also, I'm going to uh, talk about Joseph Boyce as one of the artists who could be a um, kinder spirit for the works that we are looking for. Um, and basically the idea is to follow um, concept of art or the healing power of art. That doesn't mean only necessarily art as a, art as a therapy, but art is something that has power to change, change us, to heal us in, uh, in emotional or um, you know, spiritual way. So um, I will do a presentation and after that, 
Um, I'm hoping that some of the artists who maybe don't have presentations right now visible on their websites, maybe they're working on some works right now that fits that concept, maybe they can just, uh, you know, send us email or maybe tell us more about their work and we would really love to um, include as many of our uh, artists as artists as possible. So um, that's a very sh short as I could explain. And then next Friday, I'm gonna do a little bit longer talk about the concept. So tune in next uh, Friday, um, then you can see the full presentation and see what that's all about. In the meantime, update your websites. It's not that hard and if you are active on it, well, you should all be active on Instagram. Um, get some get some new work on there and and post some new pieces so that you know we can see. It's not. I can't tell you how many times this has happened over the last six months where people that I know that are curating know that our key pie pie artists are special and that there's talent there and that there's good work there and there's good concepts there. And then they come to me later and say, I really wanted to use your artist, but Half of them don't even have updated websites. So please update your websites. Please update your, your um, social media. Um, and because there is no room for later when you say to me, I don't know why I don't get sales and I don't know why I'm not being curated into shows. Well, I'm gonna tell you right now, that's why. So um, there are people looking at your, your website. They are looking at your social media like, Keep that up to date. It should be a living history of what you do. Um, so anyway, enough of me um, belly aching about that. And uh, all of you make great work. Um, I, I would curate and have curated, I'd say probably 95% of you into shows or a show or multiple shows. Um, and there, there's a lot of great resource here and I, I it just hurts when I hear someone say like, I want to use your artist, but I can't because they don't have anything I can look at. So um, get on it and come back next Friday and watch Voice Love's presentation. And, uh, and we'll have a conversation about what that looks like and how you can get involved. And thank you, Mike O'Connor, again. Yep. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. It's fun. Yes. Thank you, Mike. And I highly recommend his, uh, his oh. workshop really very very helpful to do it as kind of a group so if you're needing a little assistance on the uh, video making i couldn't have done what i did without his guidance thank you jane wow. thank you mike thanks thank everybody thank all right you. we'll see you guys thank next you. friday see yeah. you next week thank you to you mike bye bye everybody bye bye, bye. 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 bye.